Well, one person's awake and had his coffee. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. There we go. That's a whole lot better. Well, we're going to be starting with a prelude this morning. Oh, how good it is. It was interesting. I had the privilege and the honor of doing a funeral of a friend who has been a friend for 30 years uh, last week. And when we went back to the old church to do this funeral, it was amazing how many people remembered me and that I remembered, and it was just good to be together with the family of God. It's a, fact, a matter of fact, it's good to be together with the family of God no matter where you're at, whether it's your home church or another church or you're in the airport and you happen to be sitting next to a believer in Jesus Christ. It is just good to be together with God's people. So we're going to be singing, Oh, How Good It Is. If you'd like to sing along with us, please join us. Good to see you this morning. We welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So normally about this time, I tell you about the stories, things I've learned in the garden or things I observed during, you know, work week, and I like to pass them on, but not today. Today we're going to talk about uh, blessings, giving and getting. So uh, I've often put notices in the bulletin and I've asked verbal requests for Sunday school teachers and for help uh, on the Sunday school front. And I can tell you, we need more volunteers. We don't need full time. What we need are, you know, maybe one Sunday a month or maybe one uh, every other month. So what's interesting here is you're missing out on a great blessing. And uh, what happened was 
Last week, we were doing our question and answer time during the Bible time. And Tahizi likes me to question the kids, and then if they get the answer right, throw them a lollipop. Well, Tahizi buys them in the 300-count bag. And I know because we ran out, and I had to get another bag this morning. So last week, we're going through our little Bible story, and we're going question for question for question. I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of these questions as I'm going along, and I had about 20 questions done, and Tahizi said, there's this one little boy, he doesn't have a lollipop yet. And I'm, my head is just aching. I can't think of another question. So I said, okay, he's a little guy. He's about that big. So I said, I need to find a good question. So I said to him, okay, what were the children of Israel wearing on their feet when they walked through the desert? You're wrong. They were wearing Crocs. The little guy said to me, Crocs. And I stood there with my mouth open. I'm going, Crocs. Well, he didn't know the difference between Crocs and sandals. He goes, yeah, those things. He's wearing, they're wearing Crocs. Okay, so I had a good laugh out of it. But it's great to see that these kids were so intense in trying to understand what God is trying to teach us. So you can be a blessing to them. But I tell you, more importantly, they can be a blessing to you. Because I can tell you, last week during some rough times, God just kept putting back into my mind Crocs, Crocs, and I just laughed just thinking about that. So you're missing out on an opportunity, so I will tell you that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Merciful God and Father, we thank you for your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all he's done on our behalf. Father, we are just most grateful and thankful for the gift of life that he has given. Father, we ask that it not only be on our tongue to be thankful, but to be able to share that with others. And Father, you also have told us, and Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Father, as we just talked about our, our little ones, Father, we ask that we be faithful in delivering the word to them and teaching them about you, Father. And we ask that we would encourage one another to serve in that capacity, uh, not only to be a blessing to them, but for the blessings that we also receive from working with them. Father, we pray for those saints around the world who are being persecuted and suffering. Uh, for your name's sake, Father, please be with them, comfort them, and strengthen them, and give them the help that they need. Father, we pray for the unborn children in this world, Father, so many who are aborted, and, and uh, so many parents trying to make a decision whether to or not have children, Father. We ask that uh, their hearts would be moved to compassion and have these children and not have them aborted. And the, the problem we have in this country, Father, that uh, we've lost so many children. And it's a sad state of affairs to see how many um, babies have been lost. So, Father, we ask that the consciousness of this country be awakened to the great loss that we've had. And, Father, we pray for this church and the outreach it has, Father, and we ask that we would be able to spread light and hope to those around us and we would be a good example in the neighborhood. In thy name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Let's stand together and sing, Come Christians, Join to Sing. Please rise. Amen. Oh. 
for our body life news. A few things you'll see in your bulletin. Okay, there's a church where you need to update the church directory. So please help us to, to do that by filling out that information. And that's only for the church. We don't share any of that personal information and um, it stays within the church. So if you could please complete that bulletin and update it. If you're already in the church bulletin, you know, things change, cell phone numbers, please make sure you update it and either hand it, uh, well, you could put it in the offering box on the way out. It'd probably be the easiest way to collect it or if there's an usher, you can, you can hand it to them. Uh, so please, let's do that. Looking ahead, Sunday, May 5th, Mother's Day breakfast and all, uh, that's in the Fellowship Hall. All women are invited. Invite a family, friend, a neighbor who would love to appreciate being loved on through this event. So that's Sunday, May 5th. Friday, May 10th, Man to Man is a grill out at the home of John Wilson with a continuational study in the Book of David. If you haven't been attending, you're really missing out, man. That's a really good study. Uh, Keep in mind there are devotionals in the back on the Welcome Center for our Daily Bread and our Scripture Union. And then uh, bringing a little more current today, if you go through your bulletin today, there's a baby shower for Olivia McCutcheon. And that's going to be an exciting time. And Wednesday, April 17th, the youth group uh, will meet in Fellowship Hall. Thursday, April 18th, swap. Saturday, April 20th is the Bright Hope uh, walk for life. There will be on a special note, there will be no prayer meeting this week, so you might want to uh, mark that down. So you can look about the swap meeting in the bulletin, there's further, but let's look at our um, missions moment, the Bright Hope. <clears throat> so there's a couple of ways we can, we can support Bright Hope. One is we've got our own kids walking in that, we can support our kids that way. We can uh, send money directly into uh, Bright Hope and support them in that respect also. In the back, uh, you can visit the missions table in the lobby. There's more information on Bright Hope and how they, you can become involved in saving lives and have an impact on our community. They always need prayer and they always need help, so please keep that in, in mind. So the Walk for Life is coming up this Saturday. 28, I'm sorry, 25,800 has been raised towards the $60,000 goal. 170 walkers have signed up and 26 baskets have been donated. Pray for a widespread participation, new groups to form, and for the goal to be reached. Pray for our youth group participation and others who may join them in the walk. So there's a whole write-up on Bright Hope. We also do the baby bottle coin fill-up. That should be coming shortly. Is that next month? Next month? Thank you. Next month. It's almost Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Thank you. So make sure when you see the bottles, grab a couple of them, fill them up. It's a good work. It is a good work. Okay. Now for our time of prayer and praise. Uh, there's a lot going on. <clears throat> and I, if I miss anything, I apologize. <clears throat> but we have a note from uh, Paul and Judy Lobb. It says, Dear Church Family, Paul and I would like to thank you for all your prayers and meals we received while Paul is recovering from surgery. Paul and Judy Lobb. So it's good to see Paul back out and, and uh, functioning. Uh, our brother, Pastor Fisher, is uh, sending his thanks to all who are praying for the funeral service of his friend Kenny. He says, praise the Lord, we've already seen some spiritual fruit from that service. So keep praying about that. Uh, Jennifer and Patrick Gallagher. Any news? Oh, that's good. There was okay. So let's pray about that process. And uh, <laughs> I thank God I'm not a woman. <laughs> it's not tough enough. And uh, pray for Jennifer as that uh, special time is drawing near. They have peace and an enjoyment in the process. Let's keep our brother uh, Bill Ashworth and his family in prayer. The passing of his older sister went home to be with the Lord last week. So let's keep them in our prayers. Let's pray for the Zapata family. Uh, they're all down, sick with some kind of uh, cold of some sort. Let's pray for Ron. His, uh, he had a stroke, but he is continuing to heal. And our brother Joe with infections with his catheter. So we have a lot to pray about. And uh, I'm sure we have many uh, 
requests that have not been spoken but are on our hearts and minds. So let's go to the Lord. Merciful God and Father, we, we are a needy people. We have many things to pray about. We are in, in need uh, in so many different ways in so many different areas. And Father, we just uh, brought some of these to mind, but we ask that uh, you would intercede, that you would uh, show yourself to be strong in these situations. Father, we have so many of these uh, lovely saints who have suffered so long and so many different things. And Father, you continually prop them up and help them. And we ask that they would feel your hand of encouragement with them. And we ask that uh, they would feel your love and care. And Father, we pray for the outreaches of things like Bright Hope and missions and in general, where they're either local or around the world, Father, please be with them. And we ask that there be blessings where people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and their lives are changed. And so, Father, we thank you also for the praises. We see, uh, you know, Al's arm and hand doing better, and we see uh, Paul doing better with his, his shoulder, and we have uh, many others who need help, Father. We thank you for the, uh, the good signs we see that you've uh, given us, but we pray for those who are uh, maybe suffering with something that they haven't put up for prayer that we know about, Father, but we ask you would be with them and you would answer those prayers also. We pray for your word this morning as it comes forth here. We ask your hand upon Carl as he brings forth your word. We ask that it be, uh, the Spirit would have a full control over what he says and does, and Father, that our hearts and ears would be open and be ready to take your word and to make those changes that are necessary in our own lives. In thy name we pray. Amen. Five verses 18 and 19 say, Don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So let's do just exactly that. We're going to begin this morning by singing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. song of hope and a song of joy. Even more so, we think about the wondrous mystery of God's love for us and how he redeemed us from the consequences of our own sin. 
In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In the Old Testament, there are hints and, and prophecies that look toward Christ's first coming. It's not exactly laid out in step one, step two, step three, step four like a manual, but it's there for us to see. And in that sense, it was somewhat of a mystery. But an even greater mystery is that you and I, who are Gentiles, who do not have the blood of Abraham running through our veins, are also included in the Jewish Messiah. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6 say, And when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Let's sing together, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery.
And Father, we greatly anticipate that wonderful day when you will come, when the dead in Christ will rise first and we all will be changed. But Lord, between now and then, help us to understand your great love for us, Christ's great redeeming power and authority, our necessity to believe the gospel. And then, Father, help us to understand that we need to be people who live by the rules that you laid down so that other people will know that we are your children, we're your disciples. We will help us to be the billboard, the advertisement for a wonderful life in Christ that you intended us to be. Help us to read and live your word. So as we open it now in the book of Exodus, please give us understanding as we read. Give us uh, understanding in, in life connection. And then, Lord, please send us out in powerful ways to live what we've learned this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus, oops, I forgot the advancer. Exodus chapter 20. We'll be uh, <clears throat> looking at this passage. If you did not bring a Bible, please, there should be one in the pew near you. Please feel free to use it. Uh, it's found on page 60, the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. Exodus chapter 20. Now, we are, um, we are in what is known as the Ten Commandments, or as the Jewish people would call it, the Ten Words. Those, and it's obviously not ten words, it's a lot more than just ten words, but it's a, a series of laws, it's a series of rules whereby a new nation will be established. A new nation will be established. Um, and, and these rules are important to live by. Imagine yourself going to a Nazareth football game, okay? Or maybe on a Friday night and you're there at the football game and uh, Nazareth is down by just a number of points, and all it would take is one more touchdown, and we win. So the coach comes up with this trick play. We're down, we're behind, uh, we're on our, behind our own 50-yard line, and it's, it's a tough. It's a tough one with only like five or six seconds on the clock. So what we need to do is we need to drop back, and the ball will be handed to one of the backs, and the entire line will protect him until he goes out of bounds, out, hops over the fence, underneath the stands, back around, hops back onto the track again, grabbing a piece of pipe along the way in one hand and a football in the other so that if anybody gets in his way, he can just clobber them. So he hops back into the field of play, crosses the finish line, touchdown. Why? Well, what, what? No? No. Why? He was out of bounds to begin with and... Clutching a pipe to repel invaders is certainly against the rules. People get hurt that way. Games are wonderful to play as long as you follow the rules. There are a lot of rules that seem to be cumbersome, but they're built there for your protection. And frankly, for my protection as we play the game. And such it is with the game of life. This brand new nation of Israel needed some governing authority. Remember, they were governed for all these years. So these ten words, whoops, here we go. These ten words uh, uh, will be developed later into a plethora of rules and regulations that have to do with taking those ten principles, developing them into case law as individual situations in life and living arise. Uh, and then Jesus, to make things simple, said, okay, instead of remembering all the rules and regulations, just do two things. Love God, love people. If you ever have a question about something that you'd like to do, just well, let's keep it simple. Is what am I about to do going to show a love for someone else, and is it going to show a love for God? If it is, green light, go ahead, engage. So these five to ten, uh, the first four that we studied had to relate to how to relate to God, this brand new nation, this theocracy that was being developed. Remember, no king. God would say something that the people needed to hear. Moses would be the conduit through which his words would come because they requested it, and we're going to get to that um, in weeks yet to come. We don't want to hear from God anymore. We just want you to speak to us, Moses. We're afraid when God talks. 
So Moses agreed, and that's the way God did things. So how to relate to other people. How to relate to other people. These, and remember, going into the promised land, God said, look, my choice of Israel is unconditional. I have chosen you, period, end of discussion. You will always be my chosen people. Your behavior do, will never change that. However, when you're moving into this promised land, there are some rules and regulations. You obey the rules that I lay down, and there will be tremendous blessing. Disobey, well, we're going to have some business to do that's not going to be so pleasant. So, we're in the process of these things. No other gods, no idols, no misusing God's name. And then a positive commandment, keep the Sabbath day holy. And those are the ones that we've covered so far. So, <clears throat> these next ones, have the next six, have to do with how to get along with other people. Now, how many of you are parents? Or have been parents? Yeah, okay. Well, a lot of you have been. Do you let your child run throughout the house doing whatever they want? I hope not. Uh, uh, you, 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 there are rules of the house. And when your children play with other children, are there rules like, don't hit him? <laughs> you know, there are rules for the protection of your children and their children, and God is establishing that from the very beginning. Left to ourselves, we will always, always be, there will always be someone who wants what they want and will do anything to get it. One day your child may be like the prodigal son and want what you have. Can't wait to get it so they treat you so badly during your life that you give up on them, and worse, you even give up on yourself. That is not what God wants. God wants parents honored. One day, maybe your son or your daughter will decide that they want your wealth and they can't wait for the inheritance, so they move things along a bit and put out a contract. Ooh. One day, your son or your daughter may decide that, or your son, rather, may decide, of course, maybe that fits in today's society, um, may decide that his stepmother is drop-dead gorgeous and he wants her for himself and he decides what dad uh, doesn't know won't hurt him and he seduces his father's wife. And you might think, oh my goodness, that's horrible. Really? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Happened. And Paul was just as shocked. One day your child might decide that he or she just simply wants to take what they feel, well, that what they know is yours, but they want it. And they want to buy something with it. So all of a sudden you open up your, uh, uh, your, your charge account and find that there's thousands of dollars in debt. Because they've stolen from you. One day your child feels that the punishment that, and the decision that you made is, is just awful. And out of a vengeful spirit, make a phone call to youth and family services and fabricate something that never happened. And guess who's now facing charges? Because they lied. False witness. We want... And how we get what we want can hurt or even kill other people. Don't let your wants hurt other people because their wants, unbridled and unboundaried, can hurt you. Ten Commandments necessary? Absolutely. In fact, there was, there was a book uh, in 1954 called The Lord of the Flies. Has, has anyone read it? Okay, uh, yeah, exactly. Now, the, the, the <coughs> theory or, or, or the postulation that was being examined in this book, what if you took a, a bunch of boys, shipwrecked them or airplane wrecked them on an island somewhere, and, and they're not bad kids. Wouldn't they, for themselves, on their own, erect a utopian society? No, that's not what happened in the book. And that actually fits with the description of us as sinful human beings. That's why God laid down some of these rules, so that we could get along with one another in an admirable, honorable, peaceable way. This morning we're going to look at two. We're going to look at honoring parents, and uh, then we're going to look at the next. But let's just look at verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land, and the Lord your God is giving you. Now, it's a great place to start because all of society 
is built on the foundational family unit. In fact, a child that does not learn how to obey and function within a family, well, they'll probably be dealing with either my sons or my son's co-workers and colleagues across the nation. And as you know, my sons are police officers. You can't learn to obey mom and dad. The authorities of the government probably will not command uh, other, that kind of respect from you. Now, the unique thing about this command is it's not a negative one. You know, it's not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt. It sounds kind of negative. This one is not. As a matter of fact, it's a thou shalt, here's something you need to do. And it's a good thing. And by the way, if you do it, you're going to be rewarded for it. So, <clears throat> honor your father and your mother. That's the thing to do. That your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor, what does it mean? It means, actually, the Hebrew word is a, kind of a strange word. It means to become heavy. It, it means to become weighty. In other words, the issue that is being honored or the person that is being honored weighs and is heavier than other things compared to it. So as we honor parents, we give to them a weight of importance that is significant in our lives. That's the way it should be. When the scales get tipped of what I want in the family and then what mom and dad wants, mom and dad need to be heavier than we are, and those scales need to be tipped. Those scales need to be tipped positively to honor them. It's an act of conveying or giving honor. In fact, it's repeated in the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 say, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then you know what Paul does? He says, okay, that's my statement to the Ephesian church, and I'm going to back it up with Scripture. And guess what Scripture he reads? Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. As I was listening to Dr. Bill Creasy, um, a wonderful uh, scholar, and uh, as, as he unpacks the scriptures, actually in a secular university, he teaches the Bible its literature, and my, I can't imagine he gets paid by a secular university to preach and teach the word of God in a biblical way. It's amazing. But he said he understood that passage very well because his dad explained it to him. He said, look, you better honor and obey me or I'll just take you out. I, I think he was kidding, but uh, I mean, no parent would do that. Some might be tempted, depending upon the behavior of the child, but that's not an option left to us. That's not an option left to us. The intent of this verse is so that your may, days may be prolonged in the land that God is giving you. Now, there are two things that we need to think through when we're thinking about that promise. We need to think nationally. Remember, when Israel moved into the promised land, there was a national responsibility for them generally. I mean, there would always be sinners breaking the rules, but nationally, as a nation, they needed to honor what God expected from them. And when it became apparent that the entire nation had forgotten God and was no longer honoring him, maybe committing idolatry, and it was rampant, that God said, okay, we're going to fix this. You're done in the land. I'm going to bring in another nation. They're going to dispossess you, and you're going to wish you'd never done this. And after so many years, if you repent, I will gladly restore you. And that happened a number of times throughout history. But there's also a sense in which there is a personal well-being involved. Individual obedience is the precursor to national obedience. Remember, the family unit sets the pattern of behavior for individuals of how they're going to behave inside of a community. If we can't get the microcosm right, the macrocosm is going to be way out of whack. So we've got to get this right in our homes. So nationally and personally, we need to honor our parents so that it will go well with us. Now, Oh, speaking negatively, to reinforce these ideas, God will, in, in the, actually the very next chapter, chapter 21, when, when he's making up that case law about honoring, you know, the principle is honor your father and your mother, and then I said that God would talk about instances in life where that, that uh, principle was applied to a specific instance, and thus you have case law. Case law, 
Exodus chapter 21, verse 15. Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. I guess he won't live long in the land. Whoever, in verse 17, whoever curses his father or mother shall be put to death. And again, in the book of Deuteronomy, a repetition. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, amen is the proper blank you need to fill in there. But it's the idea that, look, we need to know about these things. We need to agree. That's what amen means. To Let it be so. We agree that this is something we need to adhere to. In fact, Proverbs 30, verse 17, Solomon writes, The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. That's... That's a, an awful, an awful thing to even envision. But the idea is we need to honor those who bore and raised us. We need to honor them. Someone has said that the elderly are the only outcast group that everybody expects to join, but nobody wants the alternative. Pastor, don't get old. They used to say that when I wasn't old. But, Pastor, don't get old. And they're, they're saying, you know, the difficulties of, of being aged, the aches and the joints. I said, look, you know, there is only one other good alternative, and I have no control over that, and that's the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I get there before I get to be old. But we'll all be there someday. And, and our children, our children, if we have trained them right, will honor us even in our old age. Now, here's the positive reinforcement of that particular passage. In the book of Leviticus, again, it's, it's more case law. Every one of you shall reveal, revere rather his mother and his father. In Leviticus 19.32, you shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear the Lord your God. I am the Lord. It was interesting. In a chapel service on Friday, I had the privilege of, of speaking to the upper campus, the 6th through 12th graders. And, they, and uh, Dr. Long asked me to speak on the topic of uh, uh, the theme of the year was be more in service. So as I began to study and pray and ask God what he would want, be more in grand service. Grandparents, you need to be more in service of your grandkids. And grandchildren, you need to be more in service of your grandparents. And then that got kind of fleshed out as to pra with practical application of how that will work. But honor them. Show them respect. Tell them how much you love and appreciate them. You know, some of us still have parents left here on this earth. Just tell them. Don't keep them wondering. Make sure that they know that you have appreciated everything that you've done for them. All the sacrifices made. All, even the applications of the Board of Education to the seat of the problem. Knowing that you have been, by, even by that instruction, kept from far worse things. Honor them. In Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, it says, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, cling fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor to someone else. Now, if that's true church-wide, how much more true should it be in the family? Honoring mom and dad. Let's look at some practical ways. Some ways I suggested to some of the kids uh, toward grandparents, but obviously toward parents is listen when they speak to you. Listen when they speak to you. It, it might mean that you have to pause your video game or stop your hobby or get out from under the car and talk to mom and dad or pick up the phone when they need to hear your voice or answer the call for help. Listen when they speak to you. Tell them how much you love and respect them. And value their wisdom. A father's wisdom to a child is outlined in the book of Proverbs. As, as Solomon was speaking to his own son, he says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Forsake not your mother's teaching. 
for they are a graceful garland around your head and pendants around your neck. When moms and dads teach in the home, listen, obey, because these lessons that you are teaching them for your correct functionality in the home and in society will be reflected in the way that you model that honoring of your parents for the children who are coming after you. It is so important that no matter at what stage of life we are, that we are honoring our parents. And even today, I, I just I feel so good in my heart when the phone rings and it's one of my sons. And I'll say, Dad, what you doing on Monday? <laughs> said, why? Want to come help me change the oil? <laughs> or, 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 Dad, the car's doing this. Kalunka, kalunka, karip. I, don't, what, what, I have no idea what that means. Dad, can I bring the car up and, and we'll talk? Or, Dad, this just happened in our family. And I have a plan about how I need to deal with the children. But I don't want to make the wrong decision. Here's the situation. How did you and mom solve this when it happened in our family? I felt honored that he would even ask. He didn't have to call me. He could have just made a decision. But I felt honored that he would seek my wisdom. Turns out he was right on the money. Uh, he, he really, I, I had no other input for him. And when he executed the plan that he had formulated, it went well. And there was a good time in the home of instruction, of correction, and moving forward from there. But I just felt honored that my son would have valued my own raising of him to ask me, Dad, this is what I'm thinking. Did I miss anything? Am I going to get it right? I just felt very, very honored when he did that. You know, when you don't know how to do something, and all of you have cell phones in your pockets, what do you do? Google it. Exactly. Google it. And, and YouTube University is a wonderful thing. I mean, I think you could probably do brain surgery. No, well, no, don't. But, but, but you, you can learn almost anything. What if you would dad it? Or mom it to find out, hey, mom, hey, dad, what would you do? Help me here. You know, Paul spoke of his young disciple, Timothy, and he said that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, 5, his mother and his grandmother, because he had a Gentile father, taught him the scriptures. And he so much appreciated that teaching. And when the gospel came along, it just followed that Timothy would believe, and he did. And, and Paul even makes mention of the tremendous influence that Lois, his mother, and Eunice, his grandmother, had in Timothy's life. And Timothy was primed, ready to go, to be an apostolic envoy, to be a church planter, to be a pastor because of the efforts of mom and grandma. You see how important it is to honor them because they are trying to do their best with us. Spend time tapping into their wisdom before they're gone. On, on Friday, I had uh, used this particular book. We, we had given it to my dad uh, about six months after he came to know Christ as personal Savior. Dad came to know Christ at 67. I'm 67. And he lived the, the next 13 years for Jesus Christ, and it was wonderful. But one of the things that we wanted to do as a family, Julie found this book. It's called A Father's Legacy. And what it is, is, is it's broken up into 12 sections, one section for each month, about maybe 10 pages for each month. And, and it's kind of fill in the blanks. It asks questions that will preserve for all time your thinking as a mom and a dad. Recall for me the most important lessons you've learned in life. And Dad had five of them. Share your ideas of what makes a good friend. And Dad had some ideas. Share some insights of 
how to work well with other people. Hey, this is the kind of practical stuff moms and dads are supposed to be teaching along the way. But it's neat to have in my dad's own handwriting, which is far more legible than mine, um, uh, th these, these insights. Share, with some, share some principles from Scripture on which you have chosen to build your life. How about this one? Record here your ideas of what it takes for a husband and a wife to maintain a healthy marriage. What a way to honor mom and dad. Uh, you can go on Amazon. I, I thought it was out of print, but I just go I Googled it. <laughs> it is on Amazon, <laughs> and, and it's not terribly expensive. I mean, you can get even used copies for you know, uh, not very much money at all. But the idea is, as a parent, you have the opportunity to pass on to your children, even long after you're gone, wisdom that you are trying to instill in their lives all along. Now, <laughs> care for them. We are told in Scripture one of the ways to honor our parents, especially those of us who have parents who maybe have difficulty caring for themselves, or maybe mom or dad is a widow or a widower and has really no one left. We are told in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3, 4, and verse 8, honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household or to make some return for their parents, for this is pleasing to God. But if anyone does not provide for his own relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You need to honor your parents, even and maybe especially in their old age, that God would be honored, their needs would be met, and the name of Christ would be held high. Honor your parents. It'll be great for them. And it'll be wonderful for you. Because your children will watch you doing what God wants. And later on in life, hopefully, they'll catch what they've seen and not just what they've heard. Let's move on to the second one, and then, then, then we need to... That's going to wait till next week. <laughs> That's going to wait till that. Yeah, I had this grand idea at the, at the beginning of the week that I was going to knock all six of these off in one Sunday. I don't know. I must have hit my head or something when I was thinking that. It, it just We're just going to stop here. We're going to remember the Lord with the table and then move on from here. But let me just say this rather than conclude the way I wanted to conclude. God gave to us these boundaries. And when he set these things up as national foundations, maybe a, a precursor to a, a constitution, he set them up because, frankly, we are sinful human beings. Just read the book of Romans. Read the book of Genesis, and you're going to find out even one or two generations, well, actually the second generation, the first generation from Adam, things didn't go well with those kids. We need the guidelines, we need the boundaries, we need the rules and the regulations, but we also have to realize we violate them because we're sinners. You don't get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments, even if you could. You get to heaven by God forgiving your sin and having Christ's work on the cross applied to your account. That's how we get to heaven. And this table reminds us of the Savior who suffered because of our sinfulness. Suffered because we can't keep any rules, it seems. It's hard for us because we want what we want when we want it. And frankly, some of us don't care how we get it. And we end up hurting other people and even ourselves. But Christ offers forgiveness. Christ offers relationship with God and that relation that the price of that relationship we have a reminder in front of us so what I'd like to do now is have us stand and uh, actually turn our eyes to the Lord as the song would indicate to prepare our hearts for the table let's pray Heavenly Father we are about to come to the table 
realizing that we need your forgiveness. You set us, set up rules for our own protection and your glory, and Lord, if we're not thinking it, we're doing it. We're breaking the rules. We're running outside the boundary lines. And it hurts your heart. And often it hurts other people. We thank you that forgiveness is always available in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, because of what he did for us on the cross. Having been forgiven, help us to walk inside the boundaries that you've set up. And help us to rejoice in your bringing us back. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to sing this worship song. morning I made mention of the great grace that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that grace is not achieved by participating in this table, please. This is not a reenactment of Calvary and Christ's sacrifice on the cross. That's not what the Bible teaches. But the Bible does teach that what we are about to do would be like one of the feasts of Israel, Passover, as we remember God's great acts in history to set his people free. Or like the Feast of Purim, where God preserved an entire nation from genocide, miraculously. This table reminds us that because of Christ's work on the cross and the empty tomb, we have forgiveness available, literally, for the asking. We can establish a relationship with Christ, even though we are people who wander outside the boundaries and sometimes wander a lot. But God is interested in us staying inside the boundaries so that we can treat each other well. As a matter of fact, Paul said, participating in the table as we wander outside the boundaries, hurting other people is incompatible with participating in the table. He said the way we live is so important with this table that in 1 Corinthians 11 it said, Paul alludes to the fact that they were not living well because they were committing lawsuits against one another. They were committing idolatry. They were committing adultery. They, they were coming even to the table on a feast that was intended to bless everyone as a communal meal together, and some were getting drunk. And some were so selfish and gluttonous that if a person came late, there wasn't anything left. And it was hurtful. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 said, listen, 
you need to be examining yourself. You need to be examining yourself to make sure that your life matches what your lips proclaim. And having done that, then participate in the table. The Apostle Paul said that this particular remembrance, ceremony, if you will, is a simple one, but profound in its meaning. Listen to what he says. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that in the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The purpose of this table is to jog our memories in all that Christ has done for us. Because we wander outside the boundaries far too often. But God wants us home. While the, after uh, uh, Jim prays, while we uh, per- pass out the elements, the worship team is going to, this is the one where we sing? No, you're going to be playing. Okay, they're going to be playing. Use that time, if you are familiar with the tune, to think about the Savior. Or spend that time, maybe in quiet prayer, with reflection. And maybe if there's something you need to get right with the Lord, or someone else, this might be a good time to do it, and make plans that when you leave this place, you're going to make a phone call, or do a text message, or knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I need to make something right. That's what God would want according to his word. So I'm going to ask Jim if, if he would pray, please, uh, for uh, us as we remember with the bread. the Father Almighty decided that we needed redeeming. And the mission was to send the only begotten, the uniquely born one to the earth, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He added to his divinity our humanity, though sinless, and experienced what it was like to be human. 
He experienced temptation. He experienced death of an adoptive father and friends. Jesus walked where we walk and yet without sin. And then he went to the cross. This bread reminds us of his body, of the great gift that was given to us at Christmas time and then sacrificed at Easter time. Let's eat and remember together. The scripture further declares that there is a second part to this remembrance. And that second part concerns not just the arrival of Christ on the earth and celebrating that a body was given to him for us, but that he was willing to die. He was willing to suffer the consequences of your sin and my sin and take our place under God's awesome wrath. In the same way he took the cup, after supper saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, before we remember with the cup, we thank you for your word that it not only tells us right from wrong, but it warns us about the consequences of wrong. Your word declares that the soul that sins will die, suffering under your wrath for all eternity. But Lord, we want to thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ went upon that cross to suffer death for us, and not just the visible, physical death. He suffered your wrath as it was poured out on the cross. As we take the cup as he instructed, help us to remember that as his blood was poured out on Calvary and he died, that he died in our place. Help us to remember and give thanks. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. team will help us to remember by singing and playing.
What you hold in your hands is a representation of how much God loved you. Jesus told a parable, and it was a parable about a man who owed him a whole lot of money, 10,000 talents, which might be the equivalent of a hundred times of a man's lifetime wages. Not possible to pay back. And the king said, I forgive you. I forgive you that debt. Then there was a fellow who owed him a small amount of money, and he was not happy at all and demanded payment. The king heard about it. He was not happy. I forgave you all that debt. You should have forgiven the person who owed you a little bit. That has bearing on what we remember today and what Paul asked us to do even before the service. You hold in your hand the payment, a representative, a symbol of the payment of a debt that you could never, ever pay if you lived a hundred lifetimes. It's not silver. It's not gold. It's not Bitcoin. It's the blood of Christ who died in our place. Let's drink and remember together. The Apostle Paul makes this pronouncement. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. We need to remember today and what we just did. We need to remember the price of our salvation because He is coming back again, but we have a job to do between now and then, whether it's this afternoon or if it's not for two more thousand years. We have no idea. But our job is to proclaim the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, He who is coming back again. And we need to commit ourselves to do that, not just with our lips, but with our life. That we hold to those truths, those words that God has spoken so that we can get along well with Him and get along well with other people. And people will take a look at us and say, something's different. What is it? And we need to be ready to tell them that we have a relationship with Christ. And Christ wants a relationship with them too. Let's stand to sing. Um, advance through this song, please, James. All the way through. Yeah, keep going until you come to the next song. One more. Thank you. That's the song. Let's stand together and finish singing, Turn Your Eyes. Thank you. 
Lord Jesus, you have heard us commit ourselves to you afresh. And that commitment comes because we've had a fresh look at all you've done for us and the promises of your coming again and are sustaining us between now and then. Please, help us to go. Help us to speak and to live as you would have us so that other people who see us may know that we are followers of you and they would like that life for themselves as well. Help us to be faithful, Lord, having a renewed our appreciation for the Savior with His Supper. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.